โอ้โอ้โอ้ oh, I don't like that. Oh. Here you are then. Oh. What's that? You wanted a steak and mullet? Not a steak and mullet, a steak and mallet. Oh. It's the vampire fighting and ghosty grappling. It, it's Halloween today. Of course it is. Yes. Is that what all this gear's for then? Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Look, hey. I've got some garlic cloves. Ooh. Yes, I've got a ghosty detector. I've got a pair of bellows. What's the bellows for? Putting the wind up ghosties. Hey. <laughs> I've got hey. all sorts. Hey, what's these? That's a packet of crisps. What are they for? In case I get hungry later on. Hey, the prawn cocktail. They're my favourites. I'll have them now. No, you won't. No, you won't. I need you to help me with the supernatural. Supernatural? Yeah. Ah, you're scared, aren't you? No, I'm not scared. I yeah. don't believe in witches and vampires and ghosts. You are. Listen, listen. Story has it that this very studio is haunted. It's not, is it? Yeah. They say that every Halloween, ghosty Gertie, the phantom tea lady, comes round with a squeaky trolley and gives everybody cups of tea. Well, I've never heard it. Well, it's a wonder, because they say it makes a noise something rotten. Hey. Yeah, but don't worry, she's harmless. Harmless? Yeah. Well, if she's got no arms, how does she push the trolley? Well, I don't... Hey, hear that? <laughs> oh, that's her. No, it's a load of rubbish. Is it? Load of rubbish, is it? Yes. Well, what's that you're drinking? What's what I'm drinking? Again. It's Halloween today, the day when ghosties and vampires and witches gather together at midnight and meet with warlocks and ghouls. What, doorlocks and fools? Oh, no, hey. warlocks and ghouls, you fool. Oh. If it was fools, you'd have a house full. Hey, what's a warlock then? A warlock's a male witch. Is it? Mm. What do you call a female witch? Doris. Doris? Oh, look, just go away, will you? While I introduce the programme. Who oh, to, Doris? Go away! I want you to set the witch's coven set and don't forget the spell pot. The what pot? Spell pot, spell pot. Surely you can manage that. I think so, yes. Uh, P O T. I managed it. Oh, just get out of it. Go on. Well, get out. Hey, I like this. This is good. What's it? What's this here? Have a look. Hey, great. Oh. I've done a good job with this set, haven't I? You have. What's it all for? Well, it's to give the viewer an insight into what a witch's coven's like. Oh, oven. Sorry, I couldn't get an oven. No, Not the... oven. Coven. It's a witch's meeting place. Oh, you mean like a clubhouse? That's it. Oh. This is just like the one in Macbeth is that it? the three witches had. Oh. Yeah. Hubble, bubble, toil and trouble. I thought you said there was three of them. There was three of them. Well, hubble, bubble, toil and trouble, that's four names. No, hubble, bubble, toil and trouble is a phrase they used to stir the pot with. Why couldn't they use a spoon like everybody else? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, welcome back. As you can see, we have a witch's den in the studio. Coven. A uh, witch's coven in the studio. Uh, I'm going to knock up a spell with the aid of Barry, my sorcerer's apprentice. What's a sorcerer's apprentice? Well, he's an apprentice to a sorcerer. Oh. You know what a sorcerer is? Of course I do. It's a fellow who makes sauces, isn't it? No. Everybody knows that. Uh, I'm going to use this cauldron and an ancient spell book found in the tomb of Tutankhamun and said to hold the wonders of the universe. It was found by... Captain Kirk and the crew of the Starship Enterprise, who boldly go where no man's gone before. It was found by a team of British archaeologists in the 1920s. So you just be quiet and speak when you're spoken to. OK, I'll spot when I'm speaking to. Beat me up, Scotty. Come here. Come here. <laughs> right. Here is the spell book, and I'll read out the spell. Right. You go and get the bits and pieces and bring them in when I call them out. OK, I'll get right. the ingredients. Here's the spell. Now, the first thing we need is... Um, let's have a look. Yes, the essence of bat. I've only got a whole one. Will that do? Uh, yeah, that'll do. Bring it in. Here we are. Oh, that's perfect, that. Put it in there. In there. In there, yes. Right. Next, we need two wrinkled old grannies. I've got a couple of those in the cupboard. I'll go and get them. In the cupboard? A couple of granny smiths. Oh, that's perfect. Yes, get them in the pot. In the pot. In the pot. Next, we need a hump of camel. One hump or two? Uh, one. Oh, sorry, we've run out of those. Oh, well, I don't think it would really matter, do you? No. No, we'll leave that out. Right. Uh, while we continue with the recipe, why not sit back and watch Armchair Theatre? Yes. Matilda, you will agree, was a most unfortunate child. Not only had she three names, each one worse than the others, Matilda, Eliza and Agatha, 
but her father and mother died shortly after she was born and she was brought up exclusively by her six aunts. These were all energetic women and so on Monday Matilda was taught algebra and arithmetic by her aunt Aggie, on Tuesday biology by her aunt Beatty, on Wednesday classics by her aunt Sissy, on Thursday dancing and deportment by aunt Dory and on Friday essentials by aunt Flory. So by the time Sunday came, Matilda was often worn out and thanked their lucky stars that Aunt Gertie left for foreign parts many years before and never once threatened to come back and teach her geology and grammar on the only day she had to herself. However, poor Matilda was not entirely free for Aunt Gertie for on her seventh birthday and each one after it, she received a little poem signed Gertrude Isabel Jones to her niece with great affection. But the terrible disadvantage of the poems, pretty though they were, was that the wishes contained in them invariably came true. For instance, the one Matilda received on her eighth birthday read, Now that you are eight, Matilda dear, may shine in gifts your place adorn, and each day throughout the coming year await you with a rosy morn. The shining gifts were all very well. They were a torch, a luminous watch, pins, needles, a steel soap box, and a useful little silver brooch which said Matilda, in case she ever forgot her name. But the rosy morns were a great mistake. As you know, a red sky in the morning is a shepherd's warning, and the fatal result of Aunt Gertie's well-meaning verse was that it rained every day for a year. However, as the years went by, the poems became less troublesome, and she began to quite enjoy the endless twittering of bluebirds in the garden and the countless vases of flowers on the windowsill. When Matilda was 19, she took a job at the Ministry of Alarm and Despondency. Quite a cheerful place, really, where instead of typewriter ribbon, they use red tape. And in the main entrance, there was a large laundry basket which was labelled The Usual Channels. That's where people put letters that they didn't want to answer themselves. On the morning of her 20th birthday, Matilda didn't have time to read her letters until 10 minutes to 11 which she told herself was as it should be, as she hadn't been born till 11 in the morning. Most of the letters were from her friends, but there was the usual pink and silver envelope. May all your leisure hours be blessed, your work prove full of interest, your life hold many happy hours, and all your way be strewn with flowers. Your affectionate Aunt Gertrude. Matilda pondered, and then the gong sounded. <laughs> This was the signal for everybody to leave work and to dash down the passageway to a trolley that sold coffee and buns. Matilda left the letters and dashed with the rest. Sipping a coffee and gossiping with her friends, she'd completely forgotten about the poem when suddenly the Minister of Alarm and Despondency appeared. What's all this? What does this mean? Along the passageway were flowers growing in the most riotous profusion. Out of this jungle, the little red-faced figure of the minister fought his way. Who did this? he asked, but nobody answered. Matilda went quietly away from the chattering group and pushed through the vegetation to a room, leaving a trail of buttercups and rhododendrons behind her as she went. Mr Willoughby wasn't used to secretaries who left a trail of lobelias, primroses and the rarer form of cactus behind them when they entered the room. Miss Jones, he said. I don't like to be personal, but have you noticed that wherever you go, you leave a trail of mixed flowers? Poor Matilda burst into tears. <laughs> no, I can't seem to think about it. I can't stop it. <laughs> it's very pretty, but not very practical. We really cannot have the ministry overgrown this way. I'd be very sorry to lose you, Miss Jones. You've been most efficient. What caused this unfortunate disability, may I ask? It's a kind of spell, Matilda said, squeezing her handkerchief onto a bunch of daisies. But my dear girl, you have a national magic insurance card, haven't you? Why don't you go to the public magician? Fortunately for Matilda, the public magician's office lay just across the square from where she worked, so she didn't cause too much of a disturbance. Though the Borough Council could never account for the rare and exotic flowers which suddenly sprang up in the middle of their dusty lawns. The Borough Magician could do nothing better than advise Matilda to put an advertisement into the Times and the International Sorcerer's Bulletin, which she accordingly did. 
Aunt Gertrude, please communicate. Matilda, much distressed by last poem. When Aunt Gertrude finally read the advertisement in a 10 months old copy of the International Sorcerer's Bulletin, she packed their bags and accordingly took the next plane home. My poor dear child, Aunt Gertie said breathlessly, I had no idea that my little face would have this effect. Unfortunately, it's a banker's order at the Magician's Bank once a year from 7 till 21. I thought it would be such fun for you. At least you have only one more, though. There seems to be nothing Matilda could do but wait. On the morning of her 21st birthday, at 11 o'clock prompt, Matilda opened her pink envelope. Matilda, now you're 21. May you have every sort of fun. May you have all you've ever wanted and every future wish be granted. Every future wish be granted? Then I wish Auntie Gertie would lose her power of wishing, cried Matilda. And immediately, Aunt Gertie did. But as Aunt Gertie, with her usual thoughtlessness, had said, may you have all you ever wanted, Matilda had quite a lot of rather inconvenient things to dispose of, including a lion cub and a hippopotamus. Welcome back. And now it's time to take a look at our little experiment and see just how it's going on. How's it going on? It needs some more salt. Oh, well, just a pinch. OK. Oh, no, <laughs> a pinch of salt. Oh. I'll put it in. Hey. What? What does it do besides bubble? Well, I'm not really sure. No. But I'll tell you something. What? It'll get rid of those egg stains on your jumper. What egg stain? I've got no egg stains on my jumper. There you are. It's worked already. Hey, it has. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you something else. What? I'm hoping it'll unravel the mysteries of life. I'll tell you what it has done. What? Unraveled your socks. Look at that. I don't think you're taking this very seriously at all, are you? Of course I am. Old man river, daddy. There you are, there you are. You see, you don't even believe in the supernatural still. No, it's a load of rubbish. Right, I'll show you. Go and grab that rucksack. What for? I'm taking you out to the most haunted campsite in British Isles. We're going to pitch our tents and see what happens. What do you mean? You'll see. Go on, go on. Oh. Oh, it's quite dark for this time of the morning, isn't it? Well, I told you it was a strange place, didn't I? Hey, and there's nobody about. Ah, that's because it's haunted. Hey, yeah. haunted? Hey. Oh, I don't like ghosts and things. Mm -hmm. I think I'll put my tent up now and eat my crisps, all right? Yeah, OK. I'll put mine over here. OK. Hey, great. Hey. That's your tent over there. Thank you. We thought we'd take a look at some of the legends that abound and strange happenings that occur throughout the country. For instance, there's the great moving house mystery. Moving house mystery? Yeah, moving houses. I've never heard of moving houses. Well, you moved house recently, didn't you? Yes. Well, there you are, then. Ah, that's where I've got you, you see. I moved, my house didn't. Ah. Well, listen, the house you lived in before was your house, wasn't it? My house, yes, yes. Yeah. My house. And the house you're living in now is your house, isn't it? Yes, my house, yeah. yeah. And the house you're living in now is ten miles from where it was before. Yes, you're right. Well, there you are, then. Oh. Another great moving house mystery. And now, over to the coven to see something that I'm sure you'll find very, very interesting. I move from the house. Moving the... <laughs> yes. Oh. Hey, 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 hey! Oh, Did what? you get that stuff I asked you to get? Yeah, it's all over there, yes. Oh, good. Well, you go and stand over there, then, and pass me the stuff when I ask you for them. OK, all then. Right. right. Ah. Hello, 
Halloween is traditionally about witches. And in the studio, we have some objects of interest that are usually associated with witches. For instance, the pointed hat. Here we are. That's it. Careful, it's very sharp. Yeah, I know it's very sharp. Why is that? Well, so it fits the shape of the witch's head. Oh, is it? Oh. Believe me. I believe you. He knows. As you can see, it is black. This is because witches were supposed to wear black all the time. Er, uh, why is that? Why? Yeah. Wait, so you couldn't see them in the sky at night? Were they in the sky at night? Yeah. Well, Patrick Moore never pointed out to us, did he? I mean, he thought he would have done. Well, he couldn't if they were invisible, could he? Were they invisible? No. Oh. Now, most witches have a pet animal, and this was always called the familiar. I'm familiar with that. Good. And, with a witch, it usually took the form of a black cat. Yeah. Wait. That's not a black cat, it's a goldfish bowl. I know. Well, where's the goldfish? The cat ate it. But it's OK, the studio vet said it's going to make a complete recovery. <sighs> oh. Now, the next thing was the broom, which is always flew around on a broomstick. Mm -hmm. What's this? Well, the man at the shop didn't have a broom, but he said this is more powerful. More powerful? Didn't you yeah. tell him he needed to fly around the studio? Yeah, but it's OK. He said you can fly around the studio in no time in this. <laughs> that's it, that's it. How am I expected to do a show on the supernatural with an idiot like you around? Oh, well, it's not my fault. I mean, you asked me to get it and I went in. What was that? It's coming from the cauldron. Is it? It's not supposed to do that, is it? I don't know, is it? Hey, I tell you what. <laughs> it's only worked. In the recipe, at last, it's worked. Hey. Hey. Get a spoon and taste it. OK, then. At last. The secrets of the mysterious Easter in my power. <laughs> you said universe before. Oh, well, you have to start somewhere, and I start at the mysterious Easter. All oh, right. I'll have a taste of it. What's it like? Hey, the powers of the mysterious Easter in your hands, all right? What is it? Chicken curry. Oh. Oh, well, that's all we've got time for today, so, uh, goodbye. What's it like? It's all right, let's have a taste. Hey, it's not bad, is it? Tell you what, though. What? I could do with a cup of tea. Yes, yeah, so could I. Mm. I... Go, Chicken Gertie! Gertie! Oh. <laughs>